I'm Martha Minow. I'm the dean at Harvard Law School, and the great joy of my life is I get to do something like this today. Uh, never done this one before because I've never been able to celebrate John C.P. Goldberg before. This is really thrilling. And as uh, we do, I just want to say it's with great pride that I welcome you all to honor John on his appointment as the Eli Goldston Professor of Law. We have some special guests that I would love to extend a warm welcome to today. Excuse me for the slightly dangling participle. Uh, uh, we're joined by John's wonderful family, his wife Julie uh, Faber, who is an attorney at Harvard University General Counsel's office uh, and uh, actually the real lawyer in the family. Um, <laughs> John's father, Homer uh, Goldberg, co professor emeritus at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, a uh, revered and beloved professor. Uh, his mother, Betty Goldberg, who for many years served as the director of Gallery North, a Long Island art gallery. John's sister, Emily Goldberg, an independent filmmaker who lives in Minneapolis with her family. And John and Julie's younger son, Matthew, a senior at Concord Academy. Their older son had to look around for an excuse not to be here. And he found one by studying abroad in Dharamsala in, in India. So that was uh, inventive on his part. <laughs> Before I tell you a bit more about John, let me tell you about the chair, uh, the extraordinary man for whom this chair was named. Eli Goldston established this professorship in 1978 uh, as uh, a real tribute, I think, to an idea of what he thought the university should be. He himself was a graduate of Harvard College, uh, the law school, the business school. He served as the chair of the Eastern Gas and Fuel Associates, a large diversified energy corporation with 19 subsidiaries. Uh, he was the, the director of the First National Bank of Boston. He was the director of the Boston University Medical Center. He was a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He was a visiting fellow of the London University Graduate School of Business. He served as a visitor to the universities uh, across the country, including Harvard, MIT, Carnegie Mellon, a real visionary about the role of universities. And he believed strongly that successful business and law must go in hand with social responsibility. So he created this chair, as well as one at the business school, in order to, and I quote, um, help students join their skills and commitments in teaching research and course development to improve social conditions through men and women trained and motivated in management and legal skills. This is really kind of remarkable. Uh, and where could we find someone who could fill the terms of this chair? Mr. Golston said, uh, he said, I don't believe that business alone can solve our social problems, nor do I believe it alone has caused them, but they'll not get solved unless innovative people whose sense of a changing world and uh, a challenging world react in a fashion likely to produce profit and imagination in response to social need. I mean, seriously, could there be anybody better? John Goldberg, I think, there's nobody I have met in my life who spans the range from the most abstract philosophy all the way down to the most practical analysis. That's what he does masterfully in order to serve social need. Uh, and therefore, this is a wonderful match between chair and professor. Uh, soon after being appointed to the professorship, John said, in his own professional life, Eli Goldston melded extraordinary business acumen with a deep commitment to fairness and social responsibility. And I think that you captured very well um, why it is we're so proud to, that you hold this chair. John's scholarship in torts, in compensation systems, in legal education, in the resources of private law, uh, simply are a hint of this ability to span, to stretch between theory and practice in service of uh, human needs. Uh, that includes his work uh, in the program on foundations of private law. Um, since 2008, uh, uh, when he joined the faculty here, John has worked with Professor Henry Smith to develop this program, an interdisciplinary research program that encourages and further and reinvigorated study of traditional private law subjects, contracts towards property. 
rethinking their very place in the modern world. Uh, and actually, as I now have heard, as I travel around the world, it's called the new private law at Harvard. <laughs> um, pretty amazing. Uh, bridging economics, history, cognitive science, philosophy, and other branches of study. It, he also served as the faculty chair for the Harvard Law Review Symposium on the new private law. Uh, and uh, then, somehow, you turn around, and there is John doing the BP, BP oil spill work. I mean, you know, we go from philosophy and let's think about restitution and its concepts and, and its relationship to uh, deep moral philosophy to the question of um, what exactly um, should the Gulf Coast Claims Facility um, have as its understanding of legal liability uh, following the oil spill. And as I understand it, uh, John was tapped by Ken Feinberg, the administrator of that effort. The assignment was to figure this all out like in a day. Um, maybe it was a couple of weeks. Um, but uh, not only did John do this, um, I've heard from Ken, I've heard from other people involved in that uh, very complicated issue. It was masterful. Masterful legal analysis, timely uh, and effective. And also gave a group of law students, five of them, some pretty great experience uh, in developing a detailed report on liability under state and federal law that served as a guide for the fund payouts. Before joining our faculty, John was a professor of law and associate dean for research at Vanderbilt University, where he was recognized over and over again by students for his excellence in the classroom. He received the Best Teacher Award, the Hall Hartman Teaching Award, four times in different subjects. <laughs> this is the thing that is unbelievable about John. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, in, in never, never quite satisfied. He's, you know, let's teach yet another one. Uh, and so John has actually taught even new subjects here. An accomplished scholar, most recently uh, his forthcoming book, Recognizing Responsibilities, Duty, and Civil Recourse in the Law of Torts, um, co-authored with Ben Zapersky. They've also co-authored Tort Law, Responsibilities and Redress, uh, and uh, also the Oxford Introduction to U.S. Law Torts, and uh, a book that some of you may know, and if you don't, you should. It's called Open Book, <laughs> Succeeding on Exams from the First Day of Law School. <laughs> this is what I mean about bridging theory to the most practical. Uh, his professional activities uh, and his scholarly work uh, include publication in the very best uh, and most distinguished law reviews and serving on editorial board of the law journal Legal Theory and as editor-in-chief of the Journal of uh, Tort Law. Uh, as an active participant of the American Law Institute's drafting of third torts restatement and chair of the torts and compensation system section of the American Association of Law Schools. He does it all. He does the real law stuff, he does the philosophy stuff, and he does the bridging to um, all kinds of teaching and uh, teaching uh, reform ideas. He also actually was a real lawyer. Uh, you know, what can I say? Uh, I don't, didn't mean at all to insult you, John. Uh, and the practice at Hill and Barlow was so successful that the firm had to fold after you left. That was really <laughs> impressive. Um, a law clerk for the very distinguished district court judge, Jack Weinstein, of the Eastern District of New York, and also for Supreme Court uh, Justice Byron White. I first met John when you were editing a, a symposium in honor of Judge Weinstein, and um, I, I can only say it was a, a really a fantastic time at that moment for me to discover you, and it's been a great set of conversations ever since. Maybe John can do all the things he's done, because he was a student for so long. I don't know, <laughs> but um, he has his uh, law degree from NYU, where he was editor-in-chief of the NYU Law Review, his master's in politics from Princeton University, his MPhil in politics from St. Anthony's College at Oxford University, as well as his, his BA in, uh, with high honors from the College of Social Studies at Wesleyan University. Um, and, uh, but I actually also think it has a lot to do with the fact that he um, comes from a family that really treasures learning, that uh, is why John is such a fine teacher and has continued to have uh, his involvement in education ever since. I did feel strongly that I, in order to be sure uh, that legal accountability and responsibility is covered, that I needed to check in with some colleagues about what to say about John. So I have a couple of comments before I close. 
Henry Smith says, it's been a privilege to work with John Goldberg on classes, conferences, and private law project. His unique insights into how the state figures in what is nonetheless a distinctive private law and his philosophically sophisticated and yet legally grounded scholarship on torts have been an inspiration to me and many others who care about the fate of private law in American law schools. Robert Sitkoff said, John and I recently published an article, Torts and Estates, Remedying Wrongful Interference with Inheritance in the Stanford Law Review. What I came to appreciate while working on that project is that he is a gifted lawyer, a dazzling theorist, and a funny and generous collaborator. John Manning says, John Goldberg is the trifecta. <laughs> he is a serious scholar, a fantastic teacher, and an irreplaceable institutional contributor. His judgment is impeccable, but most of all, he is a true and generous friend and really fun to hang out with. <laughs> I couldn't say it better. Uh, John, you are a gift to me personally every day as well as to this entire community. And, af and, and as we welcome John uh, Goldberg, the Eli Goldston Professor of Law, please join me in giving him a large hand. <laughs> was way over the top. Um, <laughs> thank you, Martha. That was incredibly generous of you. Um, and thank you to my colleagues for being equally generous. Um, so uh, um, uh, before I get started, I wanted to thank especially Patricia Marullo from the Dean's Office who put all this together and made it move uh, seamlessly. So Patricia, thank you very much. Um, so uh, this weekend, I was um, uh, attended a, a fantastic musical uh, put on uh, at my son's high school. Uh, uh, and at the end of the performance, as is the custom, uh, the entire cast came up to uh, receive the audience's applause. Uh, this is a similar moment with one difference. Well, two differences. One is after the applause, they got to go home and you don't. Um, uh, but the other difference is uh, right now, there's just a, there's a spotlight on one performer, but that's just a bit of theatrical trickery. Uh, in reality, I am but one member of a cast, uh, uh, without which there would be no performance uh, and nothing at all to celebrate. It's only because of the lighting at the moment that you can't see my castmates, so please allow me uh, to redirect the spotlight, if uh, only for a moment. Uh, let me start by reiterating Martha's thanks to the donor of this chair, uh, uh, Eli Goldston. Um, uh, as she mentioned, my, my, my scholarship focuses on questions of responsibility, uh, and I would, like to thank, uh, I would like to think that Mr. Goldston would be pleased to have his name associated with that sort of work. Um, as Martha mentioned, uh, he was president of Eastern Gas and Fuel Associates, and he used that position uh, as a pulpit to preach a doctrine of corporate social responsibility. Indeed, he engaged in a famous debate with Milton Friedman, uh, the Chicago Economist, where um, uh, uh, Goldston argued powerfully against Friedman's claim that businesses satisfy their responsibilities to society merely by a relentless pursuit of the bottom line. Uh, Goldston practiced what he preached, uh, though it is thankfully commonplace now. Back in the early 60s, his company was progressive enough to advertise with billboards that featured white persons and persons of color together. Uh, he was also keenly interested in urban renewal. He played a major role in efforts to rebuild uh, build for affordable housing in Roxbury and Dorchester and to support the arts and arts education in poor communities. And uh, in case you're uh, bored, on I-93 going south of Boston, uh, make sure to look to the east as you head south of town. You will see uh, the, the painted gas tank. Uh, that's a public art installation. Uh, that's a reproduction of a work first commissioned by Goldston and painted by the artist, educator, and anti-war activist, uh, Coretta Kent. A okay. uh, few more thank yous. I want to thank my students, uh, present and past. Uh, uh, you have uh, always and appropriately pushed me uh, to be clearer. Uh, and uh, you have always, always, always taught me uh, with your questions and comments. Uh, the classroom, for me, is a sacred space and an endless source of joy, uh, and that is all because of you. I'd also like to thank my colleagues here at Harvard and my former colleagues at Vanderbilt, just as 
Teaching is profoundly collaborative between instructor and students. Scholarship is profoundly collaborative among colleagues. The, the asterisk footnotes that you see at the beginning of law review publications don't even begin to convey uh, the gratitude that I have for the many times that my colleagues have, let's say, guided me out of intellectual dead ends, <laughs> saved me from embarrassing mistakes, and helped me appreciate layers and dimensions of problems that I had not seen. I am especially thankful to have had the chance to work with, uh, side by side with, and learn from some truly extraordinary co-teachers, co-authors, and yes, even co-committee members. Um, <laughs> at the risk of embarrassing him, I need to single out one colleague in particular, my former 1L study group partner, my good friend and my regular co-author, Benjamin Zapersky, who's over there in the back. Uh, he is the James H. Quinn Professor at Fordham University School of Law. Now, as you know, tort law says that when the respective contributions of two injurers to a single victim's injury cannot be disentangled, the injury is deemed indivisible and liability is joint and several. If there is any value in this talk or in my work, uh, it is similarly indivisible and the credit is joint and several. With Ben, I am truly blessed to have been the beneficiary of an incredible partnership that has flourished for 25 years, and I can only hope it will continue for many years to come. Finally, I'm almost done with the thank yous. It shouldn't be more than another two hours. The, uh, <laughs> finally, uh, there is family. Uh, 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 the idea of thanking uh, my wonderful parents or my awesome big sister uh, just doesn't quite seem right. Uh, thanks don't even begin to cover the ground that needs to be covered uh, for all the instruction the inspiration, the security, the support, the solace, uh, that goes way beyond anything for which thanks can be given. So I guess the only sensible thing to say is that I love you very much. Uh, and the same, uh, obviously, of course, goes for my wife, Julie, uh, and my sons, Matthew, who is here today, and Alex, who somehow decided to go to the Himalayas, uh, <laughs> and is not. Um, uh, the gifts uh, they have bestowed upon me are too vast and too numerous to mention. However, uh, one is worth mentioning. Uh, no family, under any circumstances, should be expected to endure, much less cheerfully endure, the introduction into nightly dinnertime conversation of an endless stream of disturbing torts hypotheticals uh, <laughs> you are most kind to put up with. Okay. Back to me in the spotlight. My topic is inexcusable wrongs, and under that heading I want to share some thoughts about why tort law has little or no room for excuses and what that might tell us. So back in 1999, an influential Harvard law professor delivered the prestigious Gilbane lectures at Brown University. Her lectures addressed the question of what to do in the aftermath of injustice. Her particular concern was atrocities. Grave wrongs have been perpetrated. What should the law do about them? Well, Professor Minow, as she was then called, first considered a familiar possibility, vengeance. She counseled against it, as destined only to engender further wrongdoing. Another option, she noted, is forgiveness. But she rejected that too. Forgiveness, she explained, and I quote, requires a kind of transcendence that cannot be achieved on command, unquote. The trick instead is to find a path between vengeance and forgiveness. Candidates for this middle path, she said, include prosecutions, reparations, and truth commissions. With typical insight, she identified pros and cons of each. Now, I write about the less spectacular wrongs that are the stuff of everyday tort law, but Professor Minow's core idea that there is a space between vengeance and forgiveness to be occupied by a certain kind of reparative legal institution is nonetheless wholly applicable. To foreshadow, I will argue that the law of torts is by and large concerned to occupy this middle ground, not only in how it responds to wrongdoing, but in how it defines the wrongs for which it provides a response. Mass atrocities of the sort that Professor Minow discussed are inexcusable wrongs in the sense of being beyond the pale, unimaginable, unforgivable. Typical torts are inexcusable in a very different sense. They are inexcusable in that the law does not let us off the hook, even when we have a pretty good explanation for why we did wrong, including the kind of explanation that would spare us from adverse consequences in other domains. 
The fact that tort law does not, recognizes, does not recognize excuses is an important indication of the ways in which torts are a special kind of wrong. Along this dimension, at least, criminal law is actually more forgiving than tort. Excuses such as duress and provocation defeat criminal liability entirely, and an array of unnamed excuses can reduce a criminal defendant's punishment. Other branches of civil law may also be more open to excuses than tort. In contracts, things like mistake, commercial impracticability, and frustration of purpose arguably excuse breaches. Excuses also pervade ordinary morality. We tend to react less sharply to wrongs attended by an explanation that renders them more comprehensible. No less than criminal law, contract law, and ordinary morality, tort law seems concerned with holding persons answerable for their wrongs, and excuses seems to go hand in hand with answerability. And this gives us our puzzle. Why are torts, and torts alone, apparently, inexcusable wrongs? Okay. Now, to determine whether the puzzle I have just described is genuine rather than artificial, two propositions have to be true. First, it has to be true that tort law actually doesn't recognize excuses, as I have claimed. And second, it has to be true that tort law is law that defines wrongs and holds wrongdoers answerable to their victims. The rest of my talk is going to be about those two propositions. Okay. Well, uh, to know whether tort law recognizes excuses, we first need to figure out what counts as an excuse. I like this one because it's a meta, it's double excuse. The dog has an excuse as well as the person. Um, uh, now, it's going to take some work uh, to answer this question, what is an excuse, because the concept of an excuse bumps up against other related concepts. So let me give you a very simple example with three variations uh, that's designed to help isolate what it means and what it doesn't mean to make an excuse. Okay. Um, let's begin with a simple legal directive, uh, a very basic legal duty. This is the directive contained in the crime of assault and the tort of battery. The, the directive says roughly, each of us must not intentionally, physically attack another. Okay. Now imagine there's a person named Ian, and Ian is being criminally prosecuted for assault and is also being sued in tort for battery by his alleged victim, Victor. The evidence shows that Victor and Ian were having an animated conversation and that, that at the conclusion of the conversation, Victor ended up being knocked to the ground and seriously injured. How might Ian respond to the assault prosecution and the civil battery suit? Well, the first way in which Ian might respond is he might deny having committed the crime in the tort. For example, uh, suppose that just before Victor was knocked down, Ian was in the process of getting out of their conversation, disengaging, and to do that, he abruptly turned away from Victor just as Victor happened to step towards Ian. Now, because Ian, turns out, was a law student, he's carrying this huge, heavy backpack on his back, and so when he turned away, as Victor stepped forward, he knocked Victor down. If this is what really happened, Ian has not committed the crime of assault. He has not committed assault because that crime is defined to require purposeful knowing or reckless causing of bodily injury to another. Right? For similar reasons, as my tort students will tell you, uh, Ian has not committed the tort of battery. In this scenario, uh, uh, it should uh, be clear, Ian has no need for an excuse. Excuses come into play only after someone has been found to have done something wrong, to have committed, committed the wrong alleged. Now, perhaps Ian might have committed a different wrong, such as negligence, but that is beside the point. The point is that on these facts, Ian has established that he did not commit the particular wrongs he is alleged to have committed, and this is what it means to successfully deny wrongdoing. All right, second variant on Ian and Victor. In this one, now, Ian has intentionally knocked down Victor, so Ian can no longer deny that he committed a criminal assault and a tortious battery. However, Ian can prove that just before he intentionally struck Victor, Victor had threatened to stab Ian and had pulled a knife out of his pocket for that purpose. Okay. In the eyes of the law, Ian's assault and battery, they happen, but they're justified, and they're justified as an act of self-defense. Like a person who success, can successfully deny committing a tort or crime, a person with a valid justification has no need for an excuse. A justified assault and battery is not a wrong, so there's nothing to excuse. Now to the third version of our scenario. 
as in the second, Ian has intentionally knocked down Victor. So again, Ian cannot deny his assault and battery. Moreover, Ian has no claim for self-defense. Instead, the evidence shows, bear with me, this is still law school, that a few minutes before uh, 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 Ian intentionally struck Victor, Ian was pulled aside by a third person named Trisha. Trisha, it turns out, is Victor's longtime enemy, of course, and a particularly vicious individual. Unwilling to confront Victor herself, Trisha instead tells Ian, I have kidnapped your child, uh, and I will only release your child if you, Ian, go ahead and pummel Victor for me. Okay. Here, finally, we arrive, arrive at an admittedly far-fetched excuse uh, uh, scenario. In pointing to the role played by Trisha, Ian would be pleading what criminal law recognizes as the excuse of duress. A plea of duress, in effect, makes the following statement, which I'm putting words into the mouth of Ian. I cannot justify having attacked an innocent person, Victor. That was wrong. Still, I was facing incredible pressure to do the wrong thing, more pressure than a person of ordinary resilience could be expected to endure. And it is only because of that pressure that I did what I did. My wrong should therefore be excused. I should be spared adverse legal consequences, or at least subjected to less harsh consequences because of the situation. Okay. Unlike a denial or a justification, an excuse concedes that a wrong has been done. It then points to something about the situation in which the wrong was committed as a basis for rendering the wrong understandable in a way that exculpates the wrongdoer. Typically, a proffered excuse aims to show a partial disconnect between a person's will or agency on the one hand and his action on the other. A person who makes an excuse says, as does Ian in this example, well, there is a sense in which I did that, but it wasn't really fully me who did that. Now that we have a better sense of what it means to claim an excuse, we can return to the question of when excuses are or are not recognized in the law. And here is where the sharpness of the contrast between criminal doctrine and tort doctrine is revealed. In the duress scenario, the one in which Ian attacks Victor only because of Trisha's threat, Ian stands a good chance of avoiding a criminal conviction. But he will not avoid liability and tort for battery. He will have to pay compensatory damages to Victor because he intentionally attacked attacked Victor. And the reason for this pattern of legal consequences is because criminal law recognizes duress as an excuse and tort law does not. Now duress is obviously one special case, but it is far from the only case in which the same contrast can be drawn. In criminal law, an intentional attack can sometimes be excused if it was provoked by the victim. Not so in tort. The provoking victim can sue and recover from his assailant. Likewise, in criminal law, a starving person who, out of necessity, breaks into a house and steals food is not merely excused, but under the law of many jurisdictions is justified under the lesser, lesser evils doctrine. Not so in tort. The victim of the theft can sue for conversion of the food. Right. So, just to sum up, here are some excuses, all recognized in crim, including miscellaneous excuses in sentencing, none recognized in court. Now, in front of a less sophisticated audience, I would at this point rest my case for the claim that tort law does not recognize excuses, but this audience will recognize immediately a huge gap in my argument. Until now, I have focused on so-called intentional torts, such as battery and trespass, but you might object. The real action in modern tort law, as we all know, is in the law of accidents, and particularly the law of negligence. If excuses are recognized in negligence, that fact would seem to dwarf in significance the fact that they are not recognized in intentional torts. But it turns out the same is true of negligence. Uh, again, uh, preaching to the choir of my students, uh, a famous case in support of this claim is uh, a case called Vaughn versus Menlove from 1837. You remember it. Um, <laughs> This is the decision in which the defendant's ingenious lawyer argued against negligence liability on the grounds of his client's, shall we say, limited capacities. My client, the lawyer argued, was as careful as he could be given that he is an unthinking, clumsy fool. Uh, the court rejected this argument, insisting that the foolish and clumsy are held to the same standard as the sensible and the prudent. 
In so holding, the court first and foremost clarified the scope of the wrong of negligence and therefore limited what can count as a, as a successful denial of that wrong. In light of Vaughan, one cannot deny having committed legal negligence by proving that one did one's very best to be careful. But implicit in the court's ruling was a rejection of the notion that congenital clumsiness or congenital imprudence can count as an excuse. It doesn't. It does not excuse conduct that is wrongful by virtue of being careless. Now beyond Vaughan, there are lots of scenarios in which we might think that a person alleged to have commit, committed negligence has an excuse, yet will get no break from the courts. Here are two examples. Some of you may know the old Frank Capra, Jimmy Stewart movie, It's a Wonderful Life, in that the kindly old pharmacist, Mr. Gower, distraught here over the news of his son death, son's death, misfills a prescription. Had Jimmy Stewart's character, George Bailey, not been there to catch the mistake, and had the patient been poisoned, Gower would have been on the hook for negligence. That he had a pretty good excuse would not count against his liability. Or imagine a person, again, weird scenario, I apologize, who is accidentally trapped in a small dark storeroom. Despite not being in immediate physical danger and despite being reassured that help is on the way, he is overcome by claustrophobia and shatters a window in an effort to escape. He too can be deemed to have carelessly caused injury to a passerby who is cut by the flying glass. Negligence law demands a certain level of competence in the performance of one's actions and is largely indifferent even to seemingly impressive explanations of why a given actor on a given occasion acted incompetently. So I'm going to stick to my guns and say that tort law generally does not recognize excuses as a grounds for defeating liability. Excuses also have little role to play in determining compensatory damages, and this is a big difference between the damage phase of a tort case and the sentencing phase of a criminal trial. Standard instructions inform jurors that their task in setting damages is to provide an amount that will fairly, reasonably, or adequately compensate the plaintiff for his tort-related losses, past and future. The primary focus is on the tort's impact on the victim rather than the wrongfulness of the conduct in considering things like the plaintiff's out-of-pocket costs, lost earnings, pain and suffering, and lost enjoyment of life, there is little room for consideration of excuses. Now, I don't want to go press things too far, and every rule has its exception, and I, so I will, in the interest of candor, acknowledge one apparent exception to the rule that tort law does not recognize excuses. At the end of a tort case, after liability has been determined, judges and jurors sometimes apportion responsibility between a plaintiff and a defendant or among defendants on a percentage basis. The process of apportionment does seem to invite consideration of excuses, as a variant on my earlier claustrophobia example will demonstrate, although it may cause you to take the stairs after the talk. Suppose an elevator manufacturer's carelessness causes an elevator car to lose power and become stuck before leveling off at the fifth floor of a commercial building. A lone passenger is trapped inside the dark motionless car, but uses a phone in the elevator to communicate with the building security guard. The guard reassures the passenger that she will be rescued in an hour or two. Nonetheless, the passenger panics, pries open the elevator doors, and is injured attempting to pull herself up to the fifth floor. Even if it would be appropriate to assign fault to the passenger in her negligence suit against the manufacturer, a jury probably would be entitled to take into account, into account the, stress, the stress under which she acted as a reason to assign her a smaller percentage of responsibility than it would otherwise. I'm confident saying this because that's an actual case. Um, <laughs> Similarly, uh, juries faced with apportioning liability among multiple tortfeasors responsible for a single injury might assign less fault to a tortfeasor who can claim a plausible excuse for its wrongdoing. So I'm going to have to think more, and I welcome your help, on thinking through the significance of excuses in apportionment and what that tells us. Oh, fine. I've said enough on the question of whether tort law recognizes excuses. In fact, I have probably said too much. Uh, for one could argue that by identifying ways in which tort law is surprisingly insensitive to excuses, I might have unintentionally undermined the second proposition that undergirds the puzzle that I want to solve, the puzzle of how tort law can hold wrongdoers accountable for their wrongs, yet refuse to recognize excuses. Here's how I can put the problem I have created for myself. If one were to set out to prove that tort law really is not very much concerned with holding wrongdoers responsible, 
what evidence could one offer in support of that claim? Well, a good place to start would be to point to tort law's insensitivity to excuses. If tort liability attaches even to those who act under duress or out of necessity or in response to pressures that could lead persons of ordinary resilience to act carelessly, then it can't, after all, be law that is concerned with accountability for wrongdoing and must instead be law that it came, aims to accomplish something very different. If we follow this train of thought, which again I have invited, my puzzle turns out to be a false puzzle, a non-puzzle. It does not need to be solved because it is premised on the false supposition that tort law aims to hold wrongdoers answerable to victims of their wrongs. Now, I would like it to be the case that this objection is merely one that I have imagined and invented because then I could just ignore myself. But alas, uh, it turns out uh, that uh, people have actually raised versions of this objective. For example, there's Richard Posner. He has argued that tort law is not really about wrongs and responsibility, but it's a certain kind of incentive scheme. Tort law, he says, makes individuals and firms pay for the losses that they cause, not because of a backward-looking judgment that they have done something wrong, but because of a forward-looking aspiration to incentivize them to take efficient precautions against causing losses in the future. Insofar as recognition of excuses interferes with deterrence, Posner argues, there is nothing puzzling about the absence of excuses in tort. Indeed, their absence cuts in favor of understanding tort law as a scheme of deterrence rather than a scheme for holding wrongdoers responsible for their wrongs. A similar move could be made by a theorist less concerned with deterrence and more concerned with a certain kind of fairness. Some say that tort law functions to reallocate losses from those who shouldn't have to bear them to those who should. As between an innocent victim and a wrongful injurer, the fairness theorist will argue, the loss should be borne by the wrongful injurer. And this is true, he would say, even if the wrongful injurer has a darn good excuse. Now, for reasons I won't elaborate now, but I can talk about in the Q&A, uh, I think that deterrence, uh, the deterrence and loss shifting theories of tort law face serious problems at least when presented as efforts to make sense of current tort doctrine. But here I want to focus on the particular inference that I have attributed to them. The inference from the absence of excuses in tort law to the idea that tort law can't really be about wrongs and accountability. That inference, I want to say, is mistaken. Both the deterrence theorist and the fair fairness theorist are guilty, I would say, of overreacting to the demandingness or the strictness of tort duties. Tort law, as we have seen, requires us to refrain from attacking others even when we are under duress. It also requires us to be careful even when we uh, face pressures that would cause well-meaning persons of ordinary skill and resilience to be careless. Legal requirements that are this demanding seem like they can't be identifying conduct that is wrongful, but in fact they do. Uh, the inference that Posner and the fairness theorists making, uh, I would suggest, uh, rests on two related fallacies. Uh, I will call the first one the moralistic fallacy. Uh, a person in the grips of the moralistic fallacy supposes that, supposes that there is a unitary notion of what it means for conduct to be wrongful and further supposes that this unitary notion links wrongdoing to a strong form of culpability. In short, to commit the moralistic fallacy is to treat all wrongdoing as sin, as a transgression that leaves a stain on the wrongdoer's soul and that demands expiation or repentance. Similarly, a person in the grips of my second fallacy, the ought implies can fallacy, supposes that there is a unitary principle that forbids us from identifying conduct as wrongful when the putative wrongdoer lacks sufficient capacity or control over the circumstances in which his wrongdoing occurred. By the way, that's Kant, and I don't think he's guilty of this fallacy. It's just some people invoke him in support of this fallacy. Um, all right. These two fallacies, I would suggest, share an important feature. They both falsely deny that notions of wrongdoing can vary with context without thereby collapsing into vacuity. In fact, to label conduct as wrongful for purposes of criminal law means one thing and comes with certain capacity and control conditions. To label conduct as wrongful for purposes of tort law means another and comes with different and less stringent capacity and control conditions. This is why torts, unlike crimes, are inexcusable wrongs. What's special about torts? Well, 
Uh, again, apologies to my students for redundancy, but uh, all torts are injurious wrongs. No victim, no tort. We have inchoate crimes, we do not have inchoate torts. You can be criminally prosecuted for attempt, you cannot be sued for tortious attempt. So every tortious wrong is an injurious wrong. Okay? Likewise, as my co-author pointed out in a path-breaking article, you not only need an injurious wrong, you need no wrong, you need a wrong to the victim. Right? Uh, uh, if there's a wrong but it is not a wrong to the victim, you have no tort. How do we know this? Well, that's what Cardozo said in Paul's graph, so it must be true. Um, further still, tort authorizes a very particular kind of response to the commission of a wrong. The response is not from a government official, the response is from the victim. In criminal law, the case caption reads people versus defendant. In tort law, it reads victim versus defendant. A tort is always a victimization, and tort law is about victims' rights the rights of potential victims not to be injured, and the right of actual victims to respond or to obtain recourse for having been injured. Okay? So tortious wrongdoing is its own species, if you like, or genus, or whatever the right biological level is. Um, and when wrongs are defined this way, in this setting, for these purposes, a priority to a certain degree is given to the interests of victims and potential victims, and appropriately, there is less emphasis on the wrongdoer's culpability and control. This is why uh, it is a mis it's misguided to invoke moral luck, quote unquote, as an objection to tort liability. The great scholar Jeremy Waldron, for example, has condemned tort law as arbitrary because of the role it gives to mere fortuities. Driver A drives carelessly, but through sheer good luck, hits no one. Driver B drives identically, and through sheer bad luck, hits someone. How can liability, Waldron asks, fairly be imposed on B, but not A, when they have done the same thing? Well, with all due respect, he's missing the point. A and B have not done the same thing. Tort law is not simply matter, a matter of the state imposing liability for state objectives. It is a scheme for empowering victims to respond to wrongdoing. For this sort of scheme to insist on the presence of a victim is not arbitrary. It is the very point of the enterprise. It is for similar reasons I would suggest that tort is inattentive to excuses. In response to a wrongful injurer's proffered excuse, a tort victim is entitled to say, in effect, I really don't care. I really don't want to hear about it. You hurt me intentionally or carelessly. I understand that you have a pretty good explanation of why you did what you did, but that doesn't matter to me. You have wrongfully injured me, and I am now going to demand a certain kind of response from you. By contrast, criminal law involves the direct wielding of state power to vindicate the public's interest in maintaining safety, order, and fair terms of social interaction. A criminal defendant is answerable not to the victim, but to the state, and in this context looks to the law and to judge and jury to intercede to ensure that the state is wielding its coercive force in appropriate circumstances. Accordingly, criminal law operates with more stringent procedural protections for the alleged wrongdoer and with a narrower conception of what can count as a wrongdoing and with greater room for excuses. This last observation points to a related dimension of tort that further explains its lack of excuses. Excuses in criminal law allow defendants to make arguments against liability that are directed to a judge or jury. A criminal defendant's duress defense is an argument that asks the jury to make the decision to relieve the defendant of liability because of the pressures the defendant faced at the time of acting. By not recognizing duress and other excuses, tort law transfers that power from judge and jury to victim. In tort, a plea for an excuse can only be directed at the victim herself. This is part of how tort law empowers victims. It gives them more say over what sort of response there will be to the defendant's wrongdoing. Tort law invites wrongdoers who have excuses to invoke them as grounds for forgiveness from the victim. And in fact, this is not just a philosophical point, there is some empirical evidence suggesting that tort plaintiffs are actually often forgiving towards tort feasors who have an account that render their torts more understandable. 
To take one example, in a famous article, Professor Tom Baker observed that medical malpractice plaintiffs seem disinclined to seek quote unquote blood money from the doctors whom they sue, at least if there is no evidence of egregious wrongdoing. For the most part, the victims he studied were content to accept a settlement at the limits of the physician's malpractice insurance, even if they might have been able to get more from a jury. Now, obviously, there's a lot that goes into the dynamics of settlement, but part of what is going on here is a form of forgiveness, a recognition that though medical mistakes are wrong, they are sometimes excusable. Yet insofar as they are excusable, these wrongs are not excusable by operation of law. They are excusable by the victim. Let me conclude, yeah, conclude with a clarification and a suggestion. First, the clarification. Okay. It would be understandable if you were to hear in my emphasis on victims' rights an implicit endorsement of conceptions of tort that give priority to victim compensation. A focus on victims often goes hand in hand with a focus on compensation, and a focus on compensation in turn invites thoughts of workers' compensation schemes or the funds set up by Congress to compensate certain victims of 9-11. In these sorts of schemes, the focus on wrongdoing is attenuated if not completely abandoned. The important point is to get money to people who need or deserve it. This is why compensatory conceptions of tort law are often linked to strict liability rather than fault-based liability. Although I'm claiming that tort law relies on a more capacious, less fraught notion of wrongdoing than does criminal law, I do not mean to suggest that tort law severs or should sever victim compensation from wrongdoing. Tort is not a compensation scheme. It is a scheme that enables victims of wrongs to respond in a manner that holds wrongdoers accountable to them. So there really does have to be a wrong. Until someone has acted in a manner prescribed by tort law, until someone has assaulted another, defamed another, invaded another's privacy, or injured them through carelessness, for example, there is no basis for tort liability. And though, although compensation is the standard tort remedy, compensation in this context refers to the payment of money as quote unquote damages, as a form of satisfaction or vindication, not as the paying out of money as a benefit under an insurance policy or as part of a government benefits program. Talk of strict liability in turn invites my concluding observation. If there is one issue that has attracted the attention of tort scholars in the last 150 years since Holmes, it has been the issue of negligence versus strict liability. For example, my colleague Morton Horowitz, much to his credit, set off an academic firestorm by arguing that 17th and 18th century courts were quite comfortable with strict liability for accidentally caused harms, whereas 19th century courts introduced fault-based liability as a scheme for limiting liability and thereby subsidizing nascent industries such as mills and railroads. This goes to show you what sets off a firestorm in the academy. <laughs> um, my suggestion is that notwithstanding all the attention it has received, this supposed dichotomy between negligence and strict liability has been massively overblown. In tort, the divide between strict liability and fault is subtle, not stark. And it is subtle precisely because the tort notion of fault is so demanding. We are required to meet the standard of care of a person of ordinary prudence, a standard that makes few allowances for mitigating its factors, especially excuses. So the next time you hear a tort defendant, such as a product manufacturer, complain about the unfairness of being held strictly liable, you should meet that complaint with a certain amount of skepticism. The reason to be skeptical is not as Morton Horowitz suggested, because there is a long tradition of imposing tort liability without fault. Rather, you should be skeptical because there is a long tradition of imposing tort liability without regard to the sort of excuses that in other settings suffice to exculpate fault and other forms of wrongdoing. I began by invoking Martha's observation that the law sometimes must look for a middle path between vengeance and forgiveness. My suggestion is that tort law taken as a whole is just that sort of middle path. It defines wrongs, ways in which we should not treat and may not treat other people. And it defines them in an effort to protect and vindicate rights of victims. The point of the enterprise is accountability and answerability, not vengeance or <coughs> forgiveness. And when tort law is seen in this light, it is not so difficult to understand why torts are inexcusable wrongs.
Yeah, for sure. Questions? <laughs> Dean Minow. That was magnificent. It was inexcusably bright. Um, John, who, whose wrongs are these towards? Are these the wrongs to the person who's injured? Are they wrongs to the society? And does that matter in the contrast with criminal law? Yeah. So uh, these are quintessentially wrongs to the victims. And they're defined, that's why victims are built in to torts. You can't have a tort without a victim. And uh, the whole idea going back, way, way back in the English common law tradition is to distinguish between crimes, also called public wrongs, and torts, and breaches of contract, et cetera, called private wrongs. And part of what private law, shout out to Henry, uh, is all about, um, is marking off the domain of law that is interested in the interactions of uh, private individuals and saying in civil society too we have rules and norms and laws about how you people have to treat each other and that's one big part of law separate from the part of law which says government there's a bunch of rules you need to follow when you go about your business and separate from the part of law that says hey everyone the government has rules around here like rules which say, you know, don't kill each other. And if you break one of those rules, the government's going to come down hard on you. So, so the practical effect yeah. of not recognizing the excuse is that the defendant has to go after the person who caused the duress rather than the In the duress case, the yeah. Duress case. yeah. Um, and so I could explain that rule in terms of some kind of efficiency in right. the default position. Uh, do you care, or do you depend on Lord or does it matter to you if I just say that's an efficient way of thinking about it? It matters. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I am defending it on a normative ground. First of all, um, there, uh, uh, there are forms of excuse that don't involve third parties who could, in principle, pay the freight. Duress isn't one of those cases, but there are others like necessity uh, that uh, don't have someone waiting in the wings to pick up the bill. So I don't think this is simply a transfer where we say the defendant acts as a kind of way station uh, to pick up the tab until the real wrongdoer pays the bill. I think this is a view which says, yes, the, uh, you know, Trisha, in my example, she's done something wrong too, but that doesn't mean that Ian, acting under duress as far as tort law is concerned, hasn't done something wrong. They've both done something wrong, and they're each responsible, and then we've got to figure out how much to hold each of them responsible. John? Wonder, wonderful talk. Um, so, and congratulations on your chair. Um, <laughs> so, how does this fit in with these odd traditions like, on the one hand, private prosecution and yeah. key town, and on the tort side with punitive damages? Great. Um, fine. Ask the hard questions. Um, <laughs> so, um, I'll do it in reverse order. Um, Punitive damages, um, and again, I have to uh, acknowledge uh, Ben Zapersky, who's actually done a lot of work in this area, and I'll steal from it shamelessly. Um, uh, there's two different, at least two different conceptions of punitive damages. There's a conception which says when a, when a court or a jury awards punitive damages, it's awarding damages on behalf of all of us to uh, deter, to punish. It's a kind of almost quasi-criminal punishment. Uh, there's a very different conception of punitive damages which says sometimes if you, if you really mistreat someone badly, they can not only demand damages from you by way of compensation, they can also be punitive towards you or ask the jury to be punitive towards you at your behest. It's a kind of private punishment, if you will. And insofar as punitive damages are of the latter sort, they're very compatible with the larger picture of tort that I'm describing. Interestingly, insofar as the other conception of punitive damages, the more public law conceptions of punitive damages, is not compatible with tort, we find the Supreme Court jumping in and saying things like, gee, we really ought to worry about juries awarding damages on this rationale. It doesn't look anything like tort law. Well, they're right. It doesn't look anything like tort law. Key Tam, there are certainly instances in which a private plaintiff, and this again goes way back in the English tradition, there are certainly instances in which victims can play a public role. Just because the victim is suing doesn't mean we're looking at a tort suit. Often we are, usually we are, but sometimes the victim can be deputized 
if you will, to serve public function. So early on in common law history, it was the victim who brought the criminal prosecution. It was still a criminal prosecution. How do we know? Well, for example, the king could pardon the criminal prosecution when it was brought by the victim. The king could not, at least if you believe Cook and Blackstone and people like that, the king could not pardon a tort judgment. None of his business. It's between the victim and the injured. How do you distinguish between a justification and an excuse? <laughs> <laughs> Lloyd, uh, did you leave? <laughs> uh, Lloyd Weinrib, who knows way more about criminal law and theory than I do. Uh, it's very, there are, uh, there are uh, more trees have been killed um, trying to nail down the difference between a justification excuse and perhaps any other distinction in human history. Um, the, the, the rough idea which I tried to convey, and uh, it may have been too imprecise, was this idea that when you justify, you are, you are not conceding that you've done anything wrong. So in self-defense, if we allow that self-defense is a justification, the person who acts in self-defense is saying, look, in the first instance, it looks like I did something wrong. It looks like I committed battery or assault. But when we examine the facts further, we discover that actually this is one of those rare cases where I had a pretty good reason, a very good reason. I needed to defend myself from deadly force. Therefore, in the eyes of the law and maybe morality, I didn't do anything wrong. An excuse does not defeat the allegation of wrongdoing. It says, yes, fine, you got me. I did wrong. But I got a pretty good story about why I did wrong, the kind of story that ought to make you say, huh, gee, if I were in your situation, I probably would have done wrong too. That doesn't make it right, but it makes it understandable and therefore something to which perhaps we should react less strongly. Yeah. Do the elements of tort maybe incorporate excuses within them? Like Excellent. It only, it only took me six months to figure that out, and you figured it out in 30 seconds. Um, yes, is the short answer. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. The question was, the brilliant question, uh, was, um, are excuses already lurking, built into the definition of torts themselves, such that we don't find excuses outside of the definition of torts, because they're already there, crammed into the definitions? Um, it's a really great question. Um, uh, the, the, the short answer is yes and no. There are excuse like, there are, this is, you know, years of research. Uh, there, uh, there are excuse like considerations that factor into both torts and crimes, the definitions of them. So take, for example, acting under hypnosis, that favorite law school example. If you're acting under hypnosis, really, genuinely, truly, both criminal law and tort law will say you're off the hook when you hit someone or whatever. Well, why is that? Well, because it wasn't really you, right? It wasn't a reflection of your agency. Um, and that does look like an excuse. The difference is between criminal law and tort law is even on top of that built-in excuse, there's an additional set of excuses that criminal law recognizes that tort law does not. So there's still a difference. But you're right, it's a subtler difference than I first let on, so good for catching me out. Okay. Yeah. This is a question about the relationship between law and morals and what you described as the moralistic uh, fallacy. So when you get to the end, is this the, what you want to say uh, about tort law, that every violation of a legal prohibition that injures somebody else uh, is a tort and a wrong? Uh, because if that's what you want to say, then the moralistic fallacy seems wholly, wholly, wholly misplaced because the moralistic fallacy seems to be insisting what seems intuitive, that there's got to be some interesting relationship between the idea of a moral uh, wrong and a wrong that the law uh, would deal with as a tort. And so what is that relationship, given that the definition that you provide seems to be uh, that something that wasn't a wrong uh, yesterday yeah. uh, becomes a wrong today as soon as we've got a stack. Good. Um, so my view is not that just because the, uh, it has been identified by the law as a wrong, it is a wrong. So this is, my, uh, this is dancing the high wire between saying, uh, rejecting the moralistic fallacy which says all wrongs are basically the same, they're all sins, 
and the opposite uh, uh, side of the whatever, Scylla and Charybdis, is that the right one? Um, uh, Scylla, uh, that's Scylla, and then Charybdis is saying, oh, I've got an easy story here, which is uh, torts are a different kind of wrong. Okay, what kind of wrong are they? Well, they're whenever the law says you've done something you shouldn't have done. That's a vacuous conception of wrongdoing, and I mean to avoid it. Um, and I mean to avoid it in the following way. Every tort is not simply a rule which says uh, there shall be liability if. Rather, what the rule says is, here's a way you must not mistreat another person. Um, and it turns out that the requirement of mistreatment is actually pretty robust. That is to say, it's hard to find a tort, I would submit, that really is fully, truly, fully strict liability. Take, for example, uh, products liability, where we talk about strict products liability. You manufacture a product, it injures someone, you pay. That looks like it creates a problem for me, but I'm going to say it doesn't. Um, uh, and it doesn't because even within strict products liability, I would submit, there's still uh, a, 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 kernel, uh, a kernel of wrongdoing in the moral sense. Um, and the kernel of wrongdoing says it's wrong to send out a defective product into the world that's really dangerous. And when the defendant turns around, the manufacturer turns around and says, well, but I, did, I was really careful. So how could I have done wrong? The answer is it's wrong to really to send a, da a dangerous product out into the world. That is the wrong. And that's not a vacuous notion of wrong. If you don't send a dangerous, defective product out into the world, you haven't broken the rule. So the short answer is the rules of tort law embedded in torts are rules that define wrongs in a meaningful, non-vacuous sense but in a less robust sense than the moralistic fallacy would suggest. Yeah. How would you distinguish uh, tort law from contract law in so far as um, inexcusable? Yeah. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't done that part of the paper yet, <laughs> um, and so I would welcome your help. But um, uh, uh, I think it's a really interesting question. So I've been going on in this talk about tort versus crime, but you're absolutely right. I myself said at the beginning of the talk that in this respect, tort uh, and contract may be different. If something like commercial impracticability, for example, really is an excuse, uh, then what is it doing in contract when there's no such thing in tort? Um, I have a couple of thoughts. One is um, contract law is always differentiated by the fact that it sets these sort of default rules that people can work around. Right? So that may be a difference. That is to say, if you really want impracticability not to be ex an excuse, you may be able to contract around it. Um, second, there may be something distinctive about uh, the affirmative nature of contractual duties. That uh, the typical tort is a breach of a, let's call it a negative duty, a duty to refrain from injuring people in certain ways. Um, in contracts, all the duties are, of course, affirmative to, f affirmative, to fulfill a promise or an agreement that you have made, and it may be that there's more room for excuses when that's the kind of duty, but this is still very much tentative and under construction, so please email me with the correct analysis. <laughs> when you have a situation like BP where you have multiple yeah. victims, a state, city, yeah. county, what have you, and, and individual citizens, what type of strategy do you use to try to balance different interests involved? <laughs> I mean, that's an old question. Yeah. <laughs> um, is, Ken, is Ken here? <laughs> um, uh, so uh, uh, it's, a, it's a really, it's, you know, some, some wrongs are massive mm -hmm. in, in, in scale, right? Some wrongs are massive in terms of we're talking thousands of victims. Uh, uh, or, or you know, tens of thousands of victims with different kinds of claims. We get into questions of bankruptcy and how to prioritize claims. Uh, we get into questions of how to divide up liability among multiple responsible defendants. Um, uh, Bill? <laughs> um, uh, I really, this, this, this argument doesn't have anything much to say about that directly except except to say um, that uh, what I flagged earlier about apportionment, that um, it does seem to me that if you're a, def a tort defendant who's subject to liability but you have a, an excuse, um, you may have grounds to say, look, you know, BP should really pay more than Halliburton. 
or should pay more than so and so. Likewise, on the plaintiff's side, if, and I don't know that there was, but if there are plaintiffs who were involved in the BP spill who did something or did, failed to do something they could have done, but they have a pretty good excuse, then maybe their claims should be given more credence than some others. Good. Just to follow on that, yeah. are you opposed to indemnification? So that would undo our victim opportunity to forgive in the BP situation if, if BP has signed a bunch of contracts with Halliburton and all the right. other potential other parties then they can really defeat that very personal model that you seem to think is so important. Yeah. Um, I don't think I'm against indemnification, but um, uh, so I, I hope I'm not against indemnification or you know, liability insurance, right? So every time I see every time I see Professor Chevel, right, he says, "You have a nice little cute story about 18th century tort law, but now we have this thing called liability insurance, and when a tort happens, who pays?" It's not the wrongdoer, it's the liability insurer. And if it's the liability insurer, what has this got to do with wrongs and accountability and responsibility? Um, I think that's a really uh, complicated and hard question. And I, want, I want to write about that separately. But let me just, um, uh, by way of gesturing towards a response inadequately, let me just say, first of all, uh, I think it's a mistake to think of liability insurance or indemnification agreements as merely passing off responsibility or you know, sort of saying, I don't have to deal with this. I don't think that's right uh, sort of phenomenologically. And what I mean by that, it's a fancy word, but what I mean by that is most of you probably, I'm hoping, uh, drive with liability insurance on your cars. I'm guessing you still probably feel some sense that you are responsible to drive carefully. I hope you do, or at least leave before me if you don't, um, right? So just because there's money lurking in the background doesn't yet mean we've uh, established that the sort of primary wrongdoer is freed from responsibility. That's a different issue. Second of all, things like in indemnification agreements and insurance contracts are actually a way sometimes, uh, a way in which people can fulfill their responsibilities. Look, a lot of tort liability is really expensive. Uh, depending on who you hurt and how much you hurt them. And it can be out of all proportion to the gravity of the wrongdoing. A slip, a careless slip at the steering wheel and suddenly you're looking at um, uh, uh, you know, a million dollars in damages. Um, how do you fulfill that obligation which the law imposes? Well, one way to do it is to prepare for it by saying, I'm going to have some insurance. Partly because I don't want to go bankrupt when I commit a tort and partly because this is a way of fulfilling the uh, secondary obligation that results from violating the primary obligation not to commit the tort. Yeah. So we don't excuse uh, clumsiness, but, and I'm a little nervous to ask the right <laughs> word that will reveal some mistaken memory from last year's class. <laughs> um, I think I have three examples where we do provide some, some level of choosing okay. to use a different standard. Mm -hmm. uh, young children, uh, people who have yeah. in some ways excusable, like blindness. Yeah. And then if you have, if you're driving someone to the hospital, you right. say that you can drive faster. Good. So this partly goes back to the line between, and, and I didn't go into this because we all would have been very um, bored or confused or both, but um, the, uh, this goes right to the heart of the question of what's the difference between a denial, a justification, and an excuse. I want to say that in the hospital case, that's a justification. You're right to go over the speed limit to save somebody's life, at least under some circumstances, right? The, uh, the child standard of care is a very tough one, but I think at the end of the day, that's really about denial rather than about excuse. That is to say, the wrong of negligence for that class of persons is defined in such a way that if you act like a child of like age experience, blah, 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 you will have not committed the wrong. But that's the kind of response I'm going to try to give you. And you did not misremember uh, tort law from last year. Please. So I think in that same vein, this is a conversation we started having, but because I'm a professor, I don't know how we resolve it. <laughs> I, I thought you had necessity of as a class of excuse, yeah. right? Not justification. Well, it's, um, it co it's a word that covers both. OK, so when I say public necessity, you're just going to say justification, not excuse? Maybe. <laughs> Go ahead. Public necessity. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Justification. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, right, so this is a case where um, there's an out-of-control forest fire. Um, your house 
um, uh, that we need to create a fire break to control the out of control fire. We're going to burn down your house um, uh, to save us all from uh, the fire spreading, that kind of case. Um, uh, uh, or someone does it privately, is that a, I think that's probably a justification. Yeah, I think that's the short answer, but tell, tell me why I got it wrong. Well, I'm not sure you've got it wrong, but if yeah. I take it for myself to save my property, to yeah. provide a necessity case, right. then it's an example of the tort law not providing an excuse. Right, um, or a justification. Or a justification. When I say it's public necessity, right. I take it, your property, I don't pay. You say that's not an excuse. Yeah. No, I've got it all wrong. It's something else. Yeah, it's hard because um, uh, I, I need help from Henry here. But I, my recollection is that most of the public necessity cases arise based on official action. So it's a little, it's a little, no, am I wrong about that? All right, maybe, maybe. we'll talk. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, in your case of the, the victim of medical malpractice who, um, because she thinks the doctor has an excuse, decides not, decides yeah. to settle what she could have gotten more. Trouble. Yeah. The, the, the posners who want to work to me about compensation would probably say something's gone wrong there. Um, you know, we'd want her to win the yeah. case because otherwise there's, there's under deterrence. Right. Would you, under your view, is that should we be happy, sad, or indifferent that she's decided to have mercy and accept her? Well, I think, um, I think we mostly should be happy. Um, that is, this is really between the injurer and the victim so far as tort law is concerned, and if they've worked it out to their satisfaction, and we'd have to worry about whether they really have worked it out to their satisfaction, whether the plaintiff isn't being lowballed by her attorney, or da, da, da. so there's lots we'd have to worry about in terms of the process by which the settlement is reached. But assuming the settlement is reached appropriately, we're mostly happy. Um, tort law has done, in some sense, what it is supposed to do. Now, if there's a kind of gap left over, that is, if this practice of forgiveness, let's suppose it's widespread enough that it's creating a systemic problem, too many doctors are being careless because they say, oh, good news, as long as I'm not doing a really bad job, I'll be excused by the victim, so I won't pay as much, so I'll be a little less careful. Is that a plausible hypothetical? I don't know. Um, but even if it is a plausible hypothetical, that might be a really good reason to say we need something else in addition to tort law to help us solve the problem of careless doctors, right? Tort law isn't the only branch of law. It's not the only game in town. It does what it does. But if we need regulatory law or professional associations or criminal law to make up some of the deterrent slack, that might, uh, that might be perfectly appropriate. Yeah? So I had a clarifying question about contributory negligence. Yeah. That where you do find excuse for mm -hmm. And so you, you were using a, um, the lift example, yeah. the elevator example, right. as a case where um, there's one tort user, there's one victim, and um, what the, it seemed like what you were saying was what the victim did might actually be an excuse for the tort user, which doesn't seem to make any sense. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to. explaining what yeah. the victim did in her actions right. in, um, and whether or not there would be a contribution to the injury that she suffered. It right. doesn't seem to be an excuse that the tort user can make use of. That's right. No, this, the, I was assuming that the, I apologize, I wasn't clear. I was assuming that the, um, the victim trapped in the elevator could point to her excuse as grounds for reducing her comparative fault rather than grounds for reducing the defendant's fault. But you're right, some people say that just on the whole question of what counts as a victim fault, um, we use a different standard than we do with respect to uh, injurer fault. And uh, the different standard we use for victim fault, the argument goes, actually is more lenient towards victim and, uh, victims and allows for more excuses, not only on the question of how much fault to assign victims, but whether to assign any fault to the victims. And that's a, that's a debate that's ongoing right now among tort scholars um, and I need to look into, I don't know yet, uh, I don't have strong views yet on who's right about that. So there's just a couple of things that have to be done for there to be no, uh, no wrong. Here. So um, we're going to have a photo opportunity in a moment. Um, but to have that opportunity, we have to unveil something. Here it goes. <laughs> A lovely chair. Oh. <laughs> Thank you.